Vince Russo and Ed Carrara, a part of the creative team of the World Wrestling Federation, became a part of WCW. And tonight is their first night. It's their initiation. It's going to be a Nitro unlike any others that you have ever seen. October 3rd, 1999, the official end of the most successful partnership in wrestling television history, Vince Russo and Vince McMahon. Russo and partner Ed Ferrara left the World Wrestling Federation with their influence at the peak as the two creative forces in the company who at the time had no creative committee, Russo and Ferrara were writing, before going over the scripts with McMahon. Ferrara was rumored to leave since mid-99 due to the tough schedule, with reports of him giving the company notice in May 99, but was eventually convinced to stay with the company reaching all-time heights. Since taking over the company, Outside of right-hand man Pat Patterson, McMahon never gave more leeway and control over the product and direction than the team of Russo and Ferrara, with the three creatively overseeing the biggest turnaround in industry history. Things took another turn with the addition of SmackDown, a new two-hour program on network television. Russo who was already burned out from writing three hours of television a week between Raw and Heat, barely at home due to the 24-7 commitment of the job, was now asked to write additional two hours, essentially double the work with the same pay structure. The final straw was a meeting with McMahon attempting to solve the situation. On that day Russo recalls that his time in the company was over, with Russo, who surprisingly was never under contract, in Atlanta finalizing his WCW deal, McMahon was in England for a pay-per-view event with the crew. Russo informed McMahon of his decision to leave the WWF on the phone. Saying weeks later that he regretted informing McMahon that way, but the timing made it impossible for a meeting. The approximately 45 minutes phone conversation ended up changing the industry forever, as after that day McMahon would not allow himself to depend on a single writer or two again as a creative team, and the transition began from a few focused individuals working on show scripts, to an inflated crew with countless writers and advisors. The previously relatively anonymous position of backstage professional wrestling writers or bookers, got unprecedented coverage, with Russo's jump to WCW being covered in high-profile full-page articles on Entertainment Weekly, The New York Times, Multi-Channel etc., where Russo stated the workload as the main reason for leaving. On an interview on the WCW website Chad days before his first show on October 18th, Russo said that he watched the last two weeks of television, talking mainly about Monday Night Raw on October 4th and 11th. Russo noted that the WWF turnaround was a steady movement as they started in the twos in early 97, all the way to over a six average when he left over two and a half years later. Giving it six months to start to see long-term changes on and off-screen, as part of the process to build a new foundation on the program in terms of product direction and talent roster, the company hyped the arrival of Russo and Ferrara on air throughout the week, building to a new era on October 18. As part of the new regime, the plan was to give the product a fresh start by giving the veterans time off to build the others during it. That meant that outside of Bill Goldberg, perhaps the three biggest stars in the company and Hogan, Savage and Flair were all written off television in different angles within the first two weeks. Flair was attacked by the filthy animals who were set for a push, leaving Flair in a desert. Randy Savage returned on October 25th, cutting a promo telling Russo that nobody tells him what to do, and he's passing the torch and leaving the building. Hulk Hogan's angle started a week earlier on October 11th, playing to the perception that the new regime is gonna want him out of the company. Hogan promised that he will have the last laugh and left the building in a worked shoot angle. Thirteen days later he laid down for Sting at Halloween Havoc and was written off with a plan to return in the next year, while Russo talked about six months, the changes were already noticeable in his debut episode. Putting more emphasis on detailed storytelling and show-long angles that was a key element in the WWF's ascension during his run. Russo and Ferrara's identity was all over the show presenting a new fast-paced format in an intriguing program. An aspect of Russo and Ferreira during their run was some of the worked shoot angles, writing reality-based storylines based on real-life perceptions, usually appealing and aimed at the percentage of the audience who was routinely reading the news. 
The most controversial example was perhaps on the first show as Buff Bagwell, built by Russo as one of the young stars he wants to build the company around, was asked to lose to La Parka in a match, after doing the job, he complained to Russo for asking him to lose. That brought out the returning Jeff Jarrett, just 24 hours after wrestling China on the No Mercy pay-per-view, jumping to WCW presenting him as Russo's friend based on their real-life relationship. Another angle during the run was Dallas Page and Bagwell, playing off a story on Page's wife Kimberly that connected with the audience as their segments were doing big numbers on television. While the Oklahoma character is usually associated with this period, the reality was that it was a WWF creation, starting earlier in the year with Jim Ross as part of the angle to take back his announcing position from Michael Cole. The effort put in the debut show was clear to see as the program was written with the idea of presenting an eventful broadcast with little to no downtime, to not let viewers the opportunity to change the channel. The idea was to build the main event scene on Goldberg as the top guy, along with Bret Hart, The Outsiders, Scott Stainer, Sting, Sid, Luger etc. while at the same time giving more personality and elevating talents like Benoit, Bagwell, Booker, the filthy animals etc. The packed first week saw positive results as ratings jumped big to a 3.3 rating, up from a 2.6 the week before. With the 3.1 rating during the head-to-head -head 2 hours, making it the highest rated opposed episode since July. The next week increased further to a 3.5, with the 3.3 head-to-head rating the highest in over 3 months. Besides the usual politics behind the scenes, an obstacle Russo mentioned repeatedly was the constant battle with Turner's standards and practices to push for an edgy product to match the competition. Russo suggested cutting back the show to two hours, which was scheduled to start on January 3. While Russo didn't appear on camera, the plan was to hear him as an authority figure called the powers that be, showing him in his office with the back to the camera. That was going to lead to a big angle at Starcade with the powers that be written off television and Bret Hart established as the lead heel alongside Hall, Nash, Scott Stainer, and Jarrett, going against top babyface Goldberg in a big storyline into 2000. While slowly elevating new performers to main event position and bringing back the major names and special attraction programs, Bret Hart won the title at the Mayhem pay-per-view in Toronto, with a Starcade main event set against Goldberg. In the meantime Roddy Piper returned to television as an opposition to Russo, featuring some strong promos before being named the special referee for the Starcade headliner. The Starcade main event and pay-per-view in general was used to build the storyline, as opposed to giving payoff to the angles, leading to disappointing pay-per-view buys for the show. The next night, months of angles concluded with Bret Hart turning heel reuniting the NWO with the Outsiders, Stainer and Jarrett. With the company now looking to have clear direction on top, the real Goldberg vs. Bret Hart payoff match was set for the sold-out pay-per-view on January 16. With Goldberg now targeted to run through the newly formed group of heels, a major angle was set for Thunder three days later on December 23. Goldberg was making a run and chasing Bret Hart to the parking lot, while Brett drove off in his car, Goldberg was seeing Russo's limousine. The original plan was for Goldberg to use a steel pipe to smash the windows, instead Goldberg dropped the pipe and smashed the windows with his fists, cutting himself from the glass and coming inches from losing his right arm. Coming off the move to two hours on January 3rd, ratings increased for the follow-up of the storyline, doing a 3.3 and then increasing further to a 3.4 on January 10th showing signs of momentum as the NWO were doing big viewership numbers for their segments. While the news of the severity of that injury was starting to be clear, another major blow came from the other side of the headline match, Bret Hart after taking a stiff kick to the head from Goldberg during their Starcade match, along with taking further damage from hitting his head during the figure 4 ring post spot in the match, suffered a series of concussions that were made worse in the following weeks. After months of build-up, the company lost the top heel and top babyface to long-term injuries in less than a week. 
with politics running backstage from the more traditional wrestling personalities in a company who had a different philosophy than Russo's format of the wrestling product. Just three months into his run after signing a two-year contract, Russo was asked to be a part of a booking committee, as opposed to his original role as head of creative. Russo decided against it and left the company. Sullivan, who had heat with big parts of the roster, replaced Russo, leading to the group of Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Perry Saturn and Dean Malenko to ask for their release and join the WWF days later. Between the key injuries, Russo leaving, Sullivan returning leading to the talent jumping to the other company, all the progress was dismissed, as that two-week period was perhaps the final blow in recreating real competition. Looking at the key aspects of business during Russo's 13-week run from October 18, 1999 to January 10, 2000, as opposed to the previous 13 weeks before him in head-to-head -head competition. While on the surface numbers show one point of a rating increase, Russo's numbers are much more impressive in reality as not only WCW showed growth after months of dropping, his entire run was going against heavier sports competition. To put this in perspective, Raw during that same 13-week period, showed a noticeable drop going against football competition. Russo's last show on January 10 drew a 3.4 rating, the highest rating in months with the show building throughout, peaking with a 4.1 rating for the Bret Hart vs Nash main event. The highest competitive quarter rating in months. Both overall and peak rating figures on January 10, were never reached again in show history. Pay-per-views saw increase overall for Halloween Havoc, Mayhem and Star K. While attendance for both television tapings and pay-per-view events both also showed increases. House shows saw a decrease from the known long-time issue in advertising, as WCW's and then later WWE's problem of main performers on television, either working very few house shows or not working at all. That was a key factor in WCW for years as out of the top 10 most featured performers on television during this run, only two or three of them were working a full schedule, as the shows mostly featured a beat grew along with a couple of them important point for increases in business during Russo's run, was the fact that three out of the top four names in the company in Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, and Ric Flair, were off television for three months at this point.